Hey there, folks. This is Kristen Williams with another Trans Advocate Podcast. We have the regular podcast crew, which is Robin Mack and Alexis. You know, so we have columnists at the Trans Advocate. One is a column that's called Gender Nation. That's Gwyn. Uh, she Gwyn is that actually the person who started the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And she does this kind of overview of what's going on in our nation with regard to the trans community. The other one is uh, Autumn Sandine. Um, she does this kind of deep dive into each state's political climate for the trans population. So we will begin featuring those on the Trans Advocate podcast um, each, each time we do it. But before we get there, I just wanted to get your take on the... Uh, this week's uh, political developments, Ooh. things that have happened. What are your thoughts? <laughs> the thoughts are we're still alive. I'm surprised. Yes. Um, so many know, spinning wheels. Trump is still being Trump. <laughs> yes, he except, is. I, except I think he's starting to get really nervous about the whole jail thing for family <laughs> and friends. Well, you know, and I thought that it was interesting that we have this accused uh, sexual predator endorsing another sexual predator. Well, they're friends. You know, they have to do that. <laughs> I, I mean, one of the predators that, don't let predators down. <laughs> like, there we go. And, and I, I think, you know, that, that there's a certain party that perhaps when you're talking to someone from that party, it wouldn't be inappropriate to ask if they were a sexual predator and if they liked them very young. <laughs> because there's now enough that, you know, you, you have to ask. Hey, hey, you know, for the last several decades, that particular political movement has been telling us if LGBT rights come to pass, then rape... And pedophilia would be normalized. You know, I, I got to tell you, there's one thing that I missed in that. I mean, I understand that, obviously, because I've been beat up with it like everyone else. I didn't know they were talking about them doing it. Yeah, I didn't I know that that was a threat. They were just telling us their truth all along. <laughs> you know. We, why did we make it about and, us? Yeah, and, and, I, I never thought about it, but they never said who. They just huh, said it was going to happen. Right. Aww. <laughs> It's kind of like you spot it, you got it, but we missed that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know, I mean, we were thinking they were just attacking it. I, I, you know, maybe they were just telling us what they were going to do. Some pretty good evidence on us on them attacking us. I can see where do we get that. Oh my god. But yeah. So. Robin, what have you seen lately in the trans news stuff? Uh, Monica Roberts released a write-up on the fact that two trans men have thrown their hat in the ring uh, from Texas to run for... Uh, one is District 29 for... Oh, District 29. District that, isn't that the past... The, what is it? The Pearland, Pearland? Pearland area in Texas, and that's going to be Dylan Forbes. And oh, then Dylan. He's awesome. And then uh, I don't personally know Finn Jones, but he's taking on District 94, Republican incumbent. Now, is that in the Dallas area? That's in the Arlington area. Ah, uh, okay, Arlington. Very cool. So yeah. we have two out trans men running for seats here in Texas. Two out Texas trans men. Like, that's a lot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So do do these candidates have, like, their stuff together? Do they have websites where people can learn more about them or I what's know th going on? Uh, maybe Alexis knows I, more. I, I know Dylan's website is coming up. He has Facebook and is doing, like, fundraising and, and those sorts of things. So he's got that rolling. He's He hasn't filed yet. The filing date in Texas or the final filing date is December 11th, it's so all the up. candidates are scrambling right oh, now to sure, get their paperwork sure. done and their filing fees together gotcha, and that gotcha. whole bit. And I'm, I'm guessing they're both doing that. I know Dylan is. Yeah, it no. says... Oh, I was going to say that um, it says that uh, Finn is working with the Texas Freedom Caucus, and I guess Dylan would probably be working close to the Houston LGBT political caucus. Dylan's working um, with everybody from what I'm hearing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so they might have some information on them. Yeah. yeah. So as I understand it, Dylan decided to run um, very recently. Oh, well, you and, know, about the, the, the date of the you, unity Alexis, banquet. <laughs> about, you know, how that came to be. Yeah. Uh, basically, the unity banquet this year was sort of interesting. 
Phyllis Fry did this little discussion, and it sort of ended with, why aren't you running? And Dylan said he'd been thinking about running, and that just got him. He couldn't get it out of his mind. <laughs> he said he was stuck. <laughs> and he didn't get any help when he talked to me and some other people. They're all like, so why aren't you running? <laughs> And so he was. Well, I love this idea that we had this, you know, event and we had so many political voices there. And out of that comes people who are running for office. Yeah, there are two more people who are seriously considering it. One, I think, will. The other one, eh, we'll see. I don't know whether they're far enough along yet with, ah. with thinking about it. But but there were two other people seriously collecting signatures and getting money and getting people together and that. Already sort of collecting thing. signatures. Wow. Nice. And so you know, the, I mean, there's two ways you can get on the ballot. You can pay money or you can collect signatures. Mm -hmm. At this late date, it's normally pay money it's because better, the signatures yeah. take a while. Right. Unless there's a big event, in which case you can collect wow. signatures. And some of these areas for people who are not familiar with the Texas grounds is like they can be very far and wide. They can oh, be yeah. very spread out. So uh, your door to door walking gets your Fitbit out of control. <laughs> right. Mile between houses. Right. We're, t we're bringing in the country mile. <laughs> yeah. But but you do get in physical shape. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Which it looks like both these gentlemen are up to. Now, so. I understand that uh, Dylan is running against a Republican. Uh, do we know if Finn is running against? Yeah, I don't know about Finn. And Dylan's Let Republican has indicated he might not run, but then he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to. Maybe not. The, the, the one thing that I always tell people in Texas is until the final date for filing, you, you have no know, clue right? who's really running. people could throw their hat in at the yeah. last minute. And, and, and every, everyone tries to sort of re-guess and pre-guess, and there's all these mm -hmm. speculations, and, oh, so-and-so said they were running, they were doing this. Well, the 12th, you know. <laughs> <laughs> until then, no idea. So well, maybe next week. I think it's a good time to kind of uh, do the gender nation portion. So yeah, I, I would love to get some feedback about what you think about this new segment. So here we go. Gender Nation is a bi-weekly trans advocate column by the founder of the Transgender Day of Remembrance, Gwendolyn Ann Smith. Justice coming in two anti-trans murders. Vermont and Texas as a pair of anti-transgender killers get their day in court. In a grand jury trial in San Antonio, Texas, Mark Daniel Lewis was indicted in the death of Kenny McFadden, an African-American transgender woman whose body was discovered in the San Antonio River on the 9th of April. McFadden, who was 26 years old at the time of her death, worked along the river walk not far from where she was discovered. Police had initially ruled out foul play in McFadden's death due to a lack of obvious trauma on her body. But police revised their findings in June, announcing they had believed McFadden had been pushed into the river. The grand jury has agreed, noting in their indictment, that Lewis did recklessly cause the death of McFadden. That Lewis also did not attempt to assist McFadden after she fell into the river was also noted, with the indictment citing this negligence as, as being the cause of McFadden's death. Lewis has a sexual conduct offence on his record from 2013. Because of this, the grand jury added a repeat offender enhancement to their charges. He faces 20 years in prison for manslaughter, though it is unclear how the enhancement will affect this. McFadden's mother, Joanne, has expressed relief that Lewis has been charged, but added in an interview with KSAT that she feels there should be more to the case. For that person to push Kenny in the river and keep going, she said, you know, personally, I'm thinking it could be a hate crime. Meanwhile, in Burlington, Vermont, the instigator of the beating of transgender man Amos Beedy pleaded guilty to her crimes. Myla Barber is one of four people charged in the May 2016 murder that began initially as an argument at a homeless encampment. Barber, as well as four others, were accused of beating Beedy causing multiple fractures and head trauma, leading to his death. Barber had instigated the attack, leading the other three to Beedy's tent, and participated in the attack. I just want to say how truly sorry I am that I let any of this happen, said Barber after entering her plea. Beedy's sister, Ina McKinley, instantly rejected the plea. There's no apology for something like this, said McKinney. Barber has been sentenced to a minimum of 10 years in state prison. The other defendants will be tried separately. And we're back. It's interesting to have uh, 
you know, that person reading trans advocate content for us. Um, we, we've had a lot of British accent this fall. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I wanted to kind of get your thoughts about, um, I transitioned because I wanted to be an authentic person. You know, that's, that's, that was my purpose behind transition. I didn't want to lie anymore. And whatever that looked at, like wherever the transition was going to lead me is what I was committed to. That was it. There was no like in game in mind. I didn't start transition with the idea, okay, I'm going to go all the way, or I'm only going to do this. I was just open to a process of being honest and truthful. That was it. And I, I just went where it led me. Um, and I, I, I do see on, you know, new media, blogs, um, social media, um, people who start transition with a certain idea of how it must look like, where it must lead, how it must be. Um, and I, I think that that's, that can be problematic, not only for them, but for the people who are reading it thinking, ah, oh, so this is what transition, this is what being trans is about. And it's when about you, a destination. When you used to do intakes at the Transgender Center and talk to people about like what their process was going to look like and support them in those steps, would you say that it was back then? I mean, like what, early 90s, would you say? Would you say that so, it was so, so look oriented? Because um, so now who, I see a lot of look oriented conversations, but right. I, I can't, I'm just remembering, like, I doubt that that was the case for people before the economy crash. It wasn't necessarily all about looks. So uh, if you're talking about, um, so we've had several iterations of the transgender center sure. and we kind of started off with a transgender shelter because no shelters would take trans people, and that was in the 90s. And certainly at that point, the people who are, I, was, I was talking about talking to for shelter, their big thing was, I don't want to be homeless anymore, and this really sucks. And Right, the necessities. Um, you know, that, that was their deal. Um, Which is a big part of transition. You know, I mean, sometimes, like you said, your, your home changes, your right. relationships change, not just part, your hormones. Part of the risk... Part of the part, part of transition is knowing that you are risking everything, literally everything. Yeah, you might not lose your job, but you could. Mm -hmm. You might not lose your family, but you could. Mm -hmm. You might not be beaten, but you could. And right. In fact, you'll probably wind up know, knowing people who have had really bad experiences out in the world mm -hmm. and yeah. watch them go through that. Yeah, and, and one of the big things about it is with all of that, if you're too open mm -hmm. and too, here's where I'm going, you may lock yourself into something that along the way you become comfortable and you really don't want to go on, but you're committed. Right, right. right. And, and I've that's seen when that a I lot start to see people. the really unhappy people. Mm -hmm. You're right. I went to the National Transgender Health Conference. The They're about to have one. They do it biannually. I went to the last one. Are you one. talking about the Philadelphia no, that is the Philly Health Trans Conference. The National Trans Health Conference is in San Francisco and in, in Oakland, gotcha. around that area, the Bay Area. And um, they try to run it when, I guess, the one in Sweden's not going, the, the world one. Oh, the um, path. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I had the opportunity to table the gender book there. And one of the largest, this is for medical providers only. It's not an open uh, to uh I don't know, regular average people going to do workshops. That that one's more mm. like Philly Trans Health Conference for, gotcha. for all people. This is for medical providers to go and learn and talk about things. And one of the most attended workshops was detransitioning oh. because post-economy crash, post um, uh, more accessibility with hormones, a lot of people are actually detransitioning. They get to one side of the spectrum and they're not happy with it or they've lost everything and they can't be employed. So they want to know how to safely... Uh, regulate their body to to go back to a livable space mm -hmm. and one of the things that Alexis is talking about is also how to navigate those conversations with the people that they've already enrolled into being a certain way you know and I, here I want to put plant a flag because you know in 
in social discourse online, I see the anti-trans groups, the anti-trans people always use detransitioning trans people as a rhetorical tool. Not that they actually care about these people. They just care about them as a, a rhetorical tool to use in their politic and their uh, various propaganda that they like to spread. This, there's uh, this claim that there's this new wave of detransitioners and it's scaring trans advocates out of the... I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, no, about? no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a com- that's a com- that's the completely their agenda. The medical providers are looking how to... No, no, these are... These are... These are uh, fathers who you know took on everything and and risk their their family or their job or whatever for transitioning that just want to safely go back they would never even talk to those people mm. you know um these are these are social workers and uh uh, LCDCs trying to help people not get into addiction because of their depression and stuff gotcha. and to have them uh you know, navigate the realities that happen with your psyche and the hardships it takes to take it on while finding that comfortable spot in the the transition spectrum that they can stay on, you know, that they can live their life in. Right. And and a lot of people just go running past it. And and again, this is observation over time. It's sort of like, you know, take it slow so you know where you want to stop. Sure. Because any place is okay. Absolutely. And and that's what a lot of people don't understand. They're like, but but I'm not real unless. It's like, <laughs> no, not true. You're not, yeah, you're not. <laughs> you're, you're not real unless you're feeling real and, and it's right for you. And, <laughs> and, and I mean, the, the weird part about this, and this is what happened in the meeting the other night that I was talking about, is that you see this so much and it's so obvious once you've seen like 20 or 30 times when it comes up like the I'm not real unless you know I have pierced ears or whatever <laughs> I, I'm dead to pick something well I don't have pierced ears but what can I say <laughs> well and that's a good point <laughs> because <laughs> who who tells you you're not real and the and I, I yeah the internet <laughs> maybe Society. the family that you're trying to leave or you know maybe the, maybe this the people that don't support you but also a lot of newer transitioning people trying to equal Equal realness and say what realness I, is. I, I want to say that this whole concept of realness is something that everybody, regardless if you're trans or not, deals with. Yeah. You know, so if you're a woman in this culture, your body, your natural body supposedly is supposed to look like this. The double and extra so, large is size yeah. six. <laughs> yeah. You and it that. depends on the decade. <laughs> yeah. Depends on the decade. Yeah, yeah. exactly. What it's you, supposed you, to look you know, like. You need to go get liposuction. You need to increase your breast size. Guys with gynecomastia, and you need operations to reduce your breast size because men aren't supposed to have that kind of material on your chest. You need to be obsessive about going to the uh, gym and lifting and stuff because we all have this standard that is kind of pounded into our heads from the moment we were born about what realness means. What does it really mean to be a person in this culture? And so, of course, when people start transitioning, they are going to then wonder, okay, what does it mean to be a real trans person? After we've been looking at what does it mean to be a real man or a real woman all of their lives? So I think that that's a really natural um, question to consider. And there's nothing wrong with it. What gets problematic (laughs) is whenever uh, people just decide, okay, well, for me to be a trans woman. That means that I need to arrive at this destination and needs to look at this or that, and then I'll be happy. There is something, and it's been probably a year and a half since I saw it, that someone was uh, circulating on the internet and it's a checklist and you know it, it's sort of like you have to do all these things to really be a, a trans person <laughs> and some of them are really interesting uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> I mean I'm like didn't know that probably not going to do that <laughs> Well, and it reminds me of Kate Bornstein's speech at our Unity Banquet where she was kind of overviewing the gender spectrum, overviewing how things um, could be in a sort of default setting like we're talking about, like a little nitpicking setting. And in the trans community, we have the opportunity to 
raise the bar, raise the standard of what solidarity looks like, what community looks like. You know, we don't, we, we, we have the potential to not be the type of people that say, oh, you're not enough if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Right. You know, we could actually be, oh, you say you're this, I get it, and I honor you, and that's awesome. Let's move forward, fellow human. You know, like, wouldn't <laughs> but, that be great? But, you know, that's sort of like communism. Theoretically, it's a great idea until someone says, well, I'm a little better than you, though. <laughs> At which point the competition is on. Uh, I have bigger breasts than you do or perkier. Right. Or I think there's always a higher level of fabulousness, but it, but it doesn't have can. to make anybody else again, worse. That's, that's, that's uh, just a common condition within humanity. Humans. The norm. Cis people and trans people. We can reshape the norm. people of all people. There's always going to be some somebody there going, you know, your body, your clothes. But your I'm with her. Like, if you take all you have to transition your life, because you don't just transition your body. If you take all you have to transition your life and your body, then you're up to the challenge of being a better human. Like, we could really make a shift for this. That's what I'm out for. Yeah, and the only problem is that definition of what the word better means. <laughs> well! <laughs> you know, I like words like well-being, beneficial, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. <laughs> so Actually, I, I'm good with better if I get to define it. Sure. You know, it, it's sort of like dictator. I think dictators are wonderful if I'm the dictator. Oh, man. <laughs> There's this problem if someone else is, or if someone else is defining. Well, better. I was sitting for like inclusivity and everyone winning, but it didn't land that way. So all of a sudden, well, we got know, another. I think it's a wonderful thought. It was a beautiful speech. I was, I, I still love it. I watch it all you the know, time. Flowers and fields of whatever, and yeah, I think it's wonderful. I think I first ran across that stuff in like the late '60s, early '70s. Well, it, you know, it was drug enhanced, perhaps. I don't no, know. no, completely sober when I watch this. It's possible. Well, so I mean that, but. You know, what we're talking about <laughs> is kind of stabs at the heart of what uh, so-called trans, um, trans studies, trans philosophy, um, th those kinds of things look at, mm -hmm. you know, standards of realness, um, standards of authenticity. Um, what does that mean? And those applications, you know, that that's not only for trans people, it's for all people right. who live in culture. What does it mean to be authentically yourself right. in this culture? And for me, you know, whenever I was five years old, I was praying to a God to please not let me wake up in the morning because my body is not right. That was my experience of childhood, of adolescence, I tried to transition in my teens, living in a small Texas town. It did not go well, and I so-called detransitioned. So, uh -huh. in that respect, I I am too one of those people who detransitioned. Sure, sure. And it wasn't because you know I oh I found it, it all wasn't this. because you changed your mind. Right. It was because I got tired of having beer bottles thrown at me, being kicked out of yeah. places, being kicked out of my school. Around what year was this? This was uh, mid to late uh, 80s, up mm -hmm. until 88. That's whenever I detransitioned. Okay. So, yeah, um, I decided that I was going to give this whole thing about being a, a real person sure. uh, a, another go, and I went and found a job at a warehouse where I tried to study on how real men behave and yeah. act. What and did their social behavior, <laughs> their mannerisms? Out for you? <laughs> <You're> <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a lot of friends who are really upset with the Marine Corps because they promised to make a man out of them <laughs> and it did not work. <laughs> I have a bunch of friends. <laughs> well, you know, and so I, I, I transitioned because I could not live one more day lying. Right. I, I just needed to be able to be truthful about what my experience is and to do something and engage that. And so whatever that process looked like was where I was going. And um, so I, I started this transition process with kind of an open heart. And, and I think that had a lot to do with the community that I transitioned into. Like I said, mm -hmm. one of my first meetings uh, 
was the Gulf Coast Transgender Community. Very GCTC diverse. Meeting. Yeah. That was run by an intersex person, a transsexual person, and a drag queen. So we're you practically know, getting back there. Lots of different trans people, and it was okay to be right. however you are. That's okay. And that was pretty unique to this area. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I did, later discovered. I actually moved to San Francisco and found that... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that kind of community is apparently rare. <laughs> mm. Yep. It, it, yes, it was. <laughs> well, I think that's where people get in difficulty of speaking for uh, you, you. Like highlighted it perfectly. They get in difficulty in speaking for other people because you you have to have a certain amount of self reflection um, and self like courage. And then when you finally find other community, you're still kind of there for yourself to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think a lot of people get the diversity in support groups or get the diversity from the internet necessarily in an authentic way. So I don't, I, I think it is really hard pressed for people who are newly coming into the community and, tra and taking on transitioning at the same time to be our educators. I mean, at what point do you feel like, who do you think should be talking to the media and should be shaping our narrative and our, our talking points? Well, here's the question. What do we need to talk to the media about? Well, and that's the thing. The media wants to talk to us about various trans panic narratives. Oh, you know, I mean, we they, came up with this. And, and what do you think about this person over here who said this awful thing about trans people? When we switched the narrative from oh gosh, it was horrible, nobody could get hormones or anything after Harvey, to a, you know, the results of our working on this for 20 to 30 years mm -hmm. are that everybody got what they wanted. Media mm -hmm. went away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. even the ones I talk right. to regularly are like, I don't think I can tell that story. And I'm like, that's fine. <laughs> well, I think in a, a turning point, and, you know, maybe both of you have seen something different than I have, but a turning point in the media was when Laverne Cox went on Katie Kirk's show, and once again, a trans woman was asked about her genitals was asked about what surgeries has she had or not had. Um, and she had a, the Victoria's secret angel model with her on the, on the same interview. And they both said, we're no longer going to be answering these questions. Like ask us about our jobs, ask us about, and, and you see, know, stop asking us about our body. Reporters can ask you anything, but you mm -hmm. don't have to answer. Right. And I think that but that was a turning point in media access. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. You I know. remember Pierce Morgan, was it after that? He followed up with um, another, I'm trying to remember who it was. Anyway, the the person there, he, he asked the mm -hmm. same thing. And it was about that time. Yes. And they were like, no, not it. I still I know. don't need to come on to this television show and tell right. you what my genitals are. And of all like. people, Katie Kirk tried to make it into a quote unquote teachable moment. And to people in the trans community, that was rude. <laughs> but 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 it really was a teachable moment for the rest of the nation, I think, because mm -hmm. it's like you know, attention all reporters, knock it off. Right. You know, attention all reporters. We're moving on with our narratives, we're moving on with our careers, we're gonna be adding more substance and I don't think that, La I mean, Laverne Cox has said that she didn't go on there to, to take the interview in that direction, but she just wasn't going to let it go backwards anymore. And then her and Janet Mock got put into more of an educator role, more of a trans advocate role, if you will, and not just a, a, a film star and an author like they were setting out to be. They became the you have to use your voice and your platform spokespeople. I, um, it, you it, know, it, it, so it was, a lot of people have gotten under them and worked with them, but I yeah. don't think they started out wanting to be but that. Those, those, and again, those two individuals, they weren't brand new to all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They had done their work mm -hmm. and had a, a solid foundation of understanding of, what is it like to be trans? Mm -hmm. What are the different ways of being trans? You know, how to speak about this process in a mm -hmm. way that isn't exclusive or belittling of other people's experiences. So, and, and when they started to speak about their experiences and, and to draw boundaries for the media and have those boundaries respected, that seemed like that was a bit of a turning point I wonder what media would look like if we could ever have an honest discussion of trans issues. I'm almost wondering if 
there would be any interest in it at all because it's such a nothingness. You know, it's such a nothing burger. It's, yeah, we transition. And... Well, and I think that's what Alexis was getting to is like, what would we talk Pretty to the, yeah, what, you know? what would we talk to the media about? And even if you take like someone like Jazz Jennings, you know, um, mm-hmm. a young female, uh, male to female youth um, growing up early transitioning, completely supported, telling her story from from the get go from being, you know, four to five years old on a girls soccer team, not able to play because she doesn't have her gender marker matching female. I mean, they have done over and beyond in in ad and advocating and educating and using their family for visibility and now they have a talk show or not it's not a talk show but it's a reality show also and it has a reality spin to it and it's really just highlighting her life like what is it like to be this trans woman teen dating what is it like to be this trans woman teen going in and talking about surgeries and hormones so i think we're kind of you know, after we highlight a few, it's not going to be like that interesting. And, you know, even then her show's not staying on. And, and the They're not getting viewers. Most of the conflict that is depicted in trans people's lives isn't personal conflict. It's mm-hmm. not something that we're conflicted about within ourselves. It's the uh, material condition that we live in in our culture. It's these assholes over here. Mm-hmm are trying to impose X, Y, Z upon me. And how is that for me? How am I going to deal with that? How am I going to respond to it? Um, you know, my friend just got beaten up, right? How do I deal with that? How do I respond to that? I can't get a job or I, I have a job and now I'm afraid of losing my job because I don't have protections. And as much as we have, all the political media uh, agenda, if you will, we have social media like platforms, but we also have like YouTube where people and and Venmo, uh, Vimeo, you know, and all these video places where people are literally documenting all of their transition and just putting it on there. They're even showing their coming out times to their mom and their dad. It's completely searchable. Um, and that's not even age specific. It's a lot of people. So I I would just wonder where we're heading because there's got to be some tipping point and maybe in documenting things because, you know, we highlight Caitlyn Jenner, but there were plenty of YouTubers that were out and transitioning and they have way more followers to some degree. They just don't have a TV network that but, but they, they bought but into. they didn't get a $100,000 makeover job. Right, <laughs> right, And I'm talking right. just makeup, not and the it, surgery part. And, and of course, you know, um, of course, TV platforms that highlight things like the Kardashians and, you know, in Hollywood are going to also highlight something like her and Vanity Fair and whatnot. But, but it's interesting to see like who still reads into things like Vanity Fair and who still reads into things like her shows versus YouTube narratives or subscribers in different areas. How did you find people that were like you when there were no words for it? I mean, well, well, yeah, I mean, like trans- transgender so, is kind like, of a newer word. Oh, ball, no. How did you find <laughs> well, trans to, to begin people? with? I was considered special. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just special. <laughs> I mean, that's what they considered me in Southern well, Illinois. And, <laughs> it was, I, I was special. And I talked to an older a drag queen and she was like, you know, we just say, we, she said, I, I miss the day when, when we just had a secret. Like, that was more fun. Sort of it, <laughs> like, you figure out like, what the secret is. You know, pe- people certainly knew that sometimes I was a boy, sometimes I was a girl, which uh-huh. was very special. Very special. And, <laughs> and there were no terms for it. I mean, gotcha. I wasn't called any names because there weren't any names. Yeah. And every okay. now and then someone would tell me I was gay. Uh-huh. And that's okay. Whatever. So when you were, you know, in New York working with Lee Brewster. I was doing, gay. Doing, so, so <laughs> under the banner when you were doing trans advocacy, it was gay. Yeah, everybody was gay. Okay, okay. just like that, everybody. That was the word. Right, gotcha. <laughs> okay. And then after Stonewall and after people started coming out, everybody wanted their own version. The, the, the homosexuals <laughs> were like, well, we're, we're Leave different. Leave it to our communities. So, yeah. And then the lesbians had to, you know, that's when that all started splitting started out. Started splitting but, but out. Before that, it was okay. like gay. And just then, gay was gay, and, yeah. And there were some, uh, you know, the, the female impersonators, which uh-huh. were different than drag queens and, and that sort right. of stuff. And then... There were some queens. I never heard the term drag queen until uh-huh. 
Group later call. after that. Now they yeah. might have used it because I basically was scared to death most of the time. So <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> you know? sure. I was. What can I say? And how did you find people that were similar? Like, how did you find community? Was it just how did you find Lee Brewster? Well, the way I found Lee Brewster was that I was in Chicago for something. My grandfather owned some buildings in Chicago, and I was I used to go up there to sort of have fun, even you know when I was sort of young on the teenage side and it was nice because there were actually trains that actually worked uh-huh. and so you could go up there and so I was up there and someone mentioned this meeting that was being held about all sorts of you know strange gay homosexual type people about how they were going to communicate and like that and it was at a hotel and so I just went and wandered around and there were some people that seemed sort of cool and didn't seem to worry a lot about their genders and all those sorts of things. And so I started talking to him and one of the people was Lee Brewster <laughs> and he was doing some stuff and there were a lot of other people there and they were talking about starting to put out newsletters and mimeographs and like some of the discussions had to do with whether they would actually survive through the mail because this was like the crank out the blue. It smells like ammonia and you get really high smells. I still like the smell of that uh, <laughs> type thing. So there was there were all sorts of things like that. And, and, now, and that it, was the like the first or second homophile. What was it? The National Homophile. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the so-called gay rights movement. Yes, but I didn't know that together at those I, meetings. I didn't know that. I just sort of dropped in. <laughs> and, and participate, <laughs> you know, I mean, cause you know, I'm like a 16 year old kid trying to act 18. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, let, let's be really clear on this and, and it's working. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone cared. Uh, and that, so then Lee's like, Oh, you know, any chance, you know, you can come to New York. And I'm like, well, probably not right now. Cause the train doesn't run there. And I'm just getting a driver's license. But then shortly thereafter, when I ended up at Purdue, it was like, okay, I'll come over and do some stuff on weekends. And, and the, the typical joke was, well, am, am I going to be like beaten and arrested? And the answer was maybe. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll be there. <laughs> that wasn't the goal, but it was like, okay. I, I don't, if he'd said definitely, I probably still would have gone. I mean, it was Vietnam time. So let's see, I get arrested, I get a felony, I can't be drafted. Oh. <laughs> I, I think this meets a goal. <laughs> you know, I get beaten and maybe something's a little bit weird. I don't pass the physical. I guess maybe that meets a goal. I, I just didn't see a huge downside to some of these things, you know. <laughs> well, Never happened, but oh well. So how did you find community, Robin? When in 2001, like I, I graduated from high school. I didn't even have a computer. A lot of people were starting to have one at home. I literally accidentally had a... I mean, like I had a CD player, but accidentally I turned on the dial and I heard queer voices, uh, the, the, oh, the radio show. Mm-hmm. And I was shocked. I mean, I bought every Melissa Etheridge CD I could. I bought every Indigo, Go C- Indigo Girl CD I could. Right. But as far as the word trans, like I, I didn't hear that except for maybe on queer voices. And I just remember like stunned staring at the radio, um, going like oh my god there's my community (laughs) like they're coming through the radio these are real people not just ellen on tv right like i saw her as unapproachable but like these are real people in my close houston proximity and honestly i had this moment of shock and uh and 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 devastation because i knew that there was a community out there and they sounded happy and they sounded like they had their life going well for them and at the same time being a teen in my home that wasn't supported that couldn't talk about these things I just thought why doesn't if my community knows that things are this bad and they found a way to be successful such that they're on the radio why didn't they find a way to make it back to me you Mm. know and I didn't understand as a teenager like how hard it could be to be an adult and reach kids of other people until I was in my 20s, that you can't just necessarily go out and support teens. I mean, that <laughs> that too has changed. Like, GSAs didn't exist. Um, this was in a time where uh, Klein High School was in an argument with the, um, what do you want, uh, I, I get my, uh, it's not UCLA, I get the ACLU, ACLU, I mix up my acronyms. Oh, gotcha. I had a friend, Marla Dukler, she was... Um, 
a lesbian in high school and she wrote a request to have a GSA and they denied it, but that her school was able to have things like the yacht club, the gun club, the whatever, but not the GSA. And she said, I could take this to the ACLU, but it's going to take a minute and I'm going to out myself and I'm okay with that, but I'm worried about other people at school. And I was a senior and she was a, a junior. And I said, well, at least you have another year to stick around and make sure it sticks. And what I want to ask you is, is will you live with yourself if you don't do it? Right. And her parents supported her to contact the ACLU and, um, they, they went, they went against, they had that fight where if you're going to include the gay club, you have to include all clubs. They decided to include all clubs because the other clubs didn't want to shut down. And I didn't know until years later that some of my friends went to that high school and followed after her like Kuma. Um, and Kuma had a GSA accessibility because she started one. And I didn't know, um, until a few years after that into my mid twenties, uh, what it actually took to keep that GSA going, um, in the school afterwards, because teachers were being bullied to not uh, sponsor that GSA, you know, it, it's still an ongoing thing, but there was a turning point for me when I went to college after hearing queer voices, after seeing more media when, I mean, really boys don't cry made a huge difference in my life. Um, that was right when Matthew Shepard was, Mm -hmm. um, his life was taken. And I remember on MTV news, when you could see the vigil that was happening and how his life was brutally taken. Um, that was a moment in my life where I realized that, you know, it wasn't okay to be out. It wasn't safe to be out, but at the same time, our voices needed to be heard. Um, at that point I was in a college in Iowa where they were still just getting over racial discrimination. They weren't even, they were completely fine with, uh, you know, calling people faggots, uh, antagonizing them with hate threats. And the GSA in 2001 in Waverly, Iowa was, uh, really for people who worried about catching the gay, you know, they came, they came to ask, can I catch the gay? You know, and what does that look like? It was, wasn't was that for, a new Olympic demonstration sport right? or something? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it wasn't it wasn't for gay people. It was for straight people asking questions. Yeah, and I was telling Alexis like they had these uh, ally pins and and uh, with rainbow colors on them because they couldn't actually give them to gay people because that would out them in their small towns. They would give them to allies to create a safe space. And when I came back to Houston a year later and. Uh, about 2002 my my gay friends here said well who's Allie and why the hell are you wearing her button (laughs) you know and and it was interesting when I came back here to Houston in a bigger city and I said I want to find my people I actually um requested to do an internship with Hatch and I never heard back from uh, Deb Murphy she was uh overwhelmed and under supported oh, yeah. and that was my first introduction of meeting people my age was at hatch i went to one or two events it was down around the time for the gay prom and to tell you the truth um i didn't know what it was going to be like to meet my people and then i looked at them and i said that's not my people <laughs> and uh you know i found older people and i found people who were more established like i didn't find teenagers dancing at a prom like i wanted to be in the current of people who are already up to something and not necessarily just dancing and being with themselves mm. so i always find myself going to the activism going to where you can make a difference because i find myself wanting to be that person who's that bridge to that kid that's like if they establish their life so easily and they know it's still hard, what are they doing to reach out to me? One of my favorite memories of the Transgender Center was um, there was a, a trans girl who was had transitioned in her school, um, and she was, you know, she's still a kid, and she wanted to have her birthday party at the Trans Center. And so her family came out and... They had a big birthday cake, and the community right. came out. And I have this picture of the Houston trans community standing around this right. family, standing around this little girl who is smiling down at her cake. 
Aww. in the trans center, all singing to her happy birthday. And that, that was just, you know, I get cold chills the thinking about that. The reality is that that's what life looks like. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one, one thing beautiful. I wanted to mention, you know, you mentioned that you heard queer voices. Sure. Really, 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 really soon we're going to start collecting some money because queer voices, because of their parent company, mm -hmm. may be in jeopardy of disappearing. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So we want some money right. set back so that we can do a really quick recovery and they can get back on the air immediately if they go off. So y'all will start hearing some stuff about that. Great. So look at um, TFAHouston.com. It will come out on there and some other things within, uh, usually, I think it'll be about January 1 when we start it. Okay, great. And right. speaking and of, like, not folding out, like, keep volunteering. <laughs> right. There's There's been some California fires recently. So, you know, if you're part of the community and you need help, go to... Uh, TFA... Houston.com TDR, TDR fund. Fund. Dot US. Dot you US. can find it both ways. We can certainly help you out. And, uh, and, and if, if all the websites confuse you, you can always go to TFAHouston.com and we yeah. list them Just all. Just go right. to TFAHouston.com. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's the best. You can access all the stuff that we're yeah. doing. If you want to support any of that stuff, you want to support the podcast, you want to support the archive, you want to support the meetings, just all the stuff that we're doing... You can donate there. And the easiest way to support us in getting the word out to reach all people is by liking this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on and to share it with people. Yeah, if you if you you know, if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or whatever, it's really important please rate it, please leave a comment because that makes it more visible to people who need to hear it. Thank you. So, um, I guess we'll be checking in next week, yeah? All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 If you like hearing trans advocate essays and podcasts, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us. This really helps our work become more visible. If you have any comments or suggestions for who we should interview next on our podcast, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter or through our contact form at transadvocate.com. Alternatively, you can call our tip line at 708 274 7826. If you're a member of the trans, intersex or genderqueer community and need help because you're a victim of an officially declared disaster, you can get it at our Trans Disaster Relief Fund at tdrfund.us. If you're a trans or a trans alley and are currently going to college or trade school, you can apply for one of our scholarships. Moreover, if you need help getting the word out about your trans community fundraiser, we'd love to help you get the word out. The Trans Advocate is a project of the Transgender Foundation of America, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Lastly, remember to always register and vote no matter what.
was such a crazy time Looking back, look at them now Changing the world one step at a time Time to wake up, open your mind, yeah Investigative reporting, curving the information So many people, they reaching, spreading over the nation Diversity, and it's about time Go to transadvocate.com 708-274-7826 That's the hotline, yeah Shout out to Cell 16 and the Lesbian Tie Collective Shout out sisters and Olivia, trans inclusive movements. They are exposing the hate, they're sick of seeing all the hate and the suffering. Your feminism should be trans inclusive, or it really means nothing. Trans advocate, they hear the tell the story. Tell the story. Tell the world that you can no longer ignore me. Can't ignore me. Rising up, and this is the moment of glory. Show some love if you are down and you support it. Yeah. Tell me where the love at. I think it's time to keep it real. The anti-trans murder rate is at the highest out in Brazil. Trans advocate website made a site just for the cause. The way that people look at trans community will surely leave you appalled. Uh, it's time to challenge what you think about the concept of gender identity. Saving lives from the bullies, treating all the trans people like enemies. Started up a non-profit org, that's 501c3. Fact checking what they're saying online, trust me and believe me. They bring the truth to the light, dragging it while it's kicking and screaming, educating the people, remember, that sex in the body is gender, helping the world is their agenda, there's so many people that we can't forget, who started way back in the era of the pre-disco feminists, Dana Densmore, Robin Tyler, Ruth Hirschberger, oh yeah, Poppy Northcutt, Catherine McKinnon, to name a few and we applaud them, they ain't taking no shortcuts, all truth and the straight facts, however you identify, it's all love, but hate, we hate that, yeah. Trans advocate, they hear the tell the story. Tell the story. Tell the world that you can no longer ignore me. Can't ignore me. Rising up and this is the moment of glory. Show some love if you are down and you support it. Yeah. Let's trans advocate, they hear the tell the story. Tell the story. Tell the world that you can no longer ignore me. Can't ignore me. Rising up and this is the moment of glory. Moment of glory. Show some love if you are down and you support it. Yeah. Transadvocate.com 708-274-7826 We support those in respect That the world has tended to forget and neglect Y'all are missing out on some amazing Intellectual and talented individuals All cause of your prejudgments But we gonna change that We gonna open the world up and realize That we should show more love than hate <laughs> Don't be behind now Yeah One love Let's go And so throughout the night, we have a couple of individuals who are bringing up just to speak with us. Where's Phyllis Fry? Phyllis, throw this up here. Thank you very much. As all of us sit here and drink and eat and listen, and the time goes by, you're thinking, when is there going to be a bathroom break? <laughs> Okay, what would have happened if the bathroom bill had passed? No, I'm serious. What would have happened if the bathroom bill had passed? I guarantee you that Dan Patrick and his minions, and we know who they are in the city of Houston because they fought against the Equal Rights Ordinance, they would have hired constables down that hall checking your ID. They would. They would see it as a duty. That's how important it is. Now, if that law ever does pass, I've already talked to the chief of police and he said that he would be more than glad to uh, arrest me in front of the cameras so that we can get the ball rolling. Get this thing. But really and truly, you've got to think about the timetable. The next time the legislature meets is in January of 2019. The people who will be in Austin are elected 
in November of 2018. The Democrats and Republicans who are running in the primaries to run in the general election in November, I think the primaries are February or March, March of next year. Deadline is next month. That's right. And anybody who wants to run for office, that deadline is, I think, December the 11th? Okay. And we got three people here that I know of. Jennifer Poole is running for State House, right? Okay. Fran Watson is running for State Senate. <laughs> Stephen Kirkland is running for the Supreme Court. Why aren't you running? Why aren't you running? <laughs> now, I'm serious. Why aren't you running? Now, if you want to if you want to do something to help, she needs your help, and he needs your help, and she needs your help. Volunteer help, monetary help, phone call help, all that other kind of help. But you know what? We need more of our people on the ballot. Okay, you're probably thinking to yourself, man, I ain't gonna win. Follow me. <laughs> That's right. And what happened when you ran? I found friends. Not only that, but the media wanted to know what you had to say. <coughs> so that means that if you file for a House office or a Senate office, I don't care if you file as a Republican or as a Democrat, and I know there's Republicans in here because you always come up to me and the big smile on your face, I'm Republican. <laughs> and that's fine, because there's a lot of bad Republicans out there in office, and there's a lot of good Republicans, okay, who are scared, who are scared to stand up for what's right. There's a lot of good ones. We gave an award to one. Thank you, sir. But you've got to file. You have got to file. So what if you lose in February? Between December and February, I guarantee you, the media is going to come to you and they're going to want to know why you're running. And you're going to be able to say, because I've been on the Google. And I have gone to the Texas Penal Code. In, in the Google, I've gone to the Texas Penal Code, and Dan Patrick says that we've got to protect people from indecent exposure in the women's restrooms. You know what? I found that it's already against the law. And we got to protect people in the women's restrooms from people coming in and masturbating and indecent exposure. You know what? I found out it was already against the law. And everything that those idiots are saying is already against the law. And you get to say that. And you get to stand up. So I want about five or six more, y'all. <laughs> to run. I don't care if you lose in February. You've got to run. And that's about all I've got to say. It's okay to be a trans advocate.
This Trans Advocate podcast was produced by Kristen Williams and is copyrighted by the Transgender Foundation of America. All rights reserved. The Transgender Foundation of America is not responsible for the opinions or comments by individual participants.